All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy Wednesday. Um, we will go ahead and get started. It is one o'clock. Uh, so I know we still have some people filing in, uh, but we, for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Addressing Sexual Behavior with Caitlin today. Um, you guys are in for a great presentation. This is the second session of it, so we're really excited. Um, we have a, we had a lot of ch chatter going on last time, so we're super excited to to get everyone's experiences and to talk about uh, talk about addressing sexual behaviors. Um, my name is Danielle Daly. I'm the professional development coordinator here with the Illinois Crisis Prevention Network. I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items, uh, and then Caitlin will go ahead and get started. We will run until two fifteen today. Um, as always. At, your cameras are disabled, you are muted. I did see a couple raised hands. Just make sure you, you're, you are utilizing that chat box throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, use that Q&A. Um, I see some more raised hands. Um, please be sure that you are um, using that chat box throughout the presentation. If you have questions, uh, we will be sure to address those throughout. Um, also make sure that your settings are set to everyone. I think it defaults to hosts and panelists. So in order to ensure that everyone can see your responses or your questions, please be sure to change that to everyone. Um, also, please be sure to um, visit our website, icpn.org. You can view all of our upcoming webinars as well as review some past recordings. Uh, we do have a couple on there currently, um, one for July 17th. It's the second session of Normalizing Mental Health. And then July 24th, we have How to Build a Therapeutic Rapport. Um, so those are up and going. You can register for those. Um, if you're on our mailing list, you also receive um, the information on when those opened. If you are not on our mailing list, if you go to the top right-hand corner of our website, uh, you can join. It's real easy. Put in your contact information, and we'll send you an email every time that we have a webinar that opens up. Um, let's see. Certificates. Um, I know that everyone is, or not everyone, there's a lot of people that are looking for their certificates before June 30th, um, as that is the end of the fiscal year in terms of getting your CEUs, some of you. Um, we have started to implement a new system. So certificates should be to you by tomorrow afternoon, um, pending we have no issues with um technology, right? Um, but super excited that there will be not be a delay anymore of you receiving your certificates. Um, so please be on the lookout for those. Like I said, by tomorrow afternoon, you should all have your certificates. Um, I did sit down an email today that has the presentation attached. Um, I did receive some um, some ones that came back. Um, some email addresses are not allowing me to send you stuff. So if for some reason you did not receive that email and you want the presentation, please just feel free to reach out to me. Um, I will put my email address into the, the chat box now, but it is ddaily at hope.us. Um, I can put all the information again into the chat box and uh, we'll revisit it too at the end. Um, but I want to hand it on over to Caitlin so that she has time to go through her presentation. So thank you, Caitlin, for being here again. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm so excited um, that there is such a good turnout and that people are excited about this topic because it is definitely a topic that I'm excited about talking about. And I think we need more people talking about this topic, right? Um, so just a little bit of background um, about me. So really at my core, I strive to be an advocate for human rights and dignity for all individuals, especially um, intellect individuals with IDD um, and special education students, and then also marginalized populations, including the queer community, um, is very near and dear to my heart. So happy Pride, everyone. Um, I also have 20 years of experience, which makes me feel so old to say, um, working with individuals with IDD. I started way back when, when I was 16, as a Special Olympics coach um, and a Special Rec volunteer. And that part-time job turned into my lifelong passion. Um, so I was a special ed teacher for 12 years. I started in a therapeutic school with individuals with very intense, severe behavior, and then spent most of my career um, teaching intermedi intermediate and middle school, self-contained, primarily autism, um, as well as doing ABA part-time on the side um, for pretty much the majority of that time as well. So now I am a BCBA 
with SST, the support services team here out of New Lenox. Um, and kind of all of these experiences have led me to be passionate about this topic. Because so way back when I was a Special Olympics coach, if any of you have experience um, coaching Special Olympics, you know the excitement that is making it to state. And the excitement over that is pretty much staying in a hotel room. Very exciting for our individuals. And the first time I stayed in a hotel room with individuals, with IDD, I we had an experience where two of the individuals had some quote unquote sexually inappropriate behavior. And the way that it was dealt with really was just confusing to me because these were two adults who were consenting and were clear that they were consenting. And the behavior was so punished and frowned upon and everyone was so uncomfortable about it. And it really, you know, as a teenager, just didn't make sense. Um, so I feel like as I've grown as a professional, it's been something that anytime there's a presentation I can attend about this topic or research it, that's really where my mind goes because I don't think that we have enough research and we have enough presentations and knowledge about sexual behavior as a whole. Um, I'm sure also, as you can imagine, working with middle school students going through puberty, there was a lot of masturbation and a lot of growing into your body type of things happening in my classroom every year. So that is definitely something that's kind of shaped me as a professional as well. So what we're going to look at talking about today is first starting with the ethics related to sexual behavior, kind of going over heteronormativity and its impact on the IDD adult population, human rights and dignity in the forefront of our interventions and really what that looks like, components of comprehensive sexuality education, um, as well as some guidelines for teaching and just why that topic is so very important. And then we'll look at issues in treatment planning discussions for some common sexual behaviors that we see that we get referred to SST for. Um, we'll go over consent and assent, non-consensual touching, age confusion or pedophilic behaviors, masturbation is like the big one, um, and then looking at questions that you may have and feedback. Um, just so that you're aware, I am looking at the chat and trying to monitor it. Um, but I am not the best multitasker on Zoom. So Danielle is also monitoring the chat. And if there's pressing questions, she'll pop up um, and make sure that I'm aware. Um, but I'm trying to read along um, as best I can. But I'm sorry if I miss questions, but we can revisit those um, again at the end. All right, so as we get started, just so that everyone is aware, and it is consenting to participate because this is a difficult topic. And that's it's difficult because of our own learning histories, our own culture, our education, our religion. I know I grew up in a Catholic, very Catholic, Catholic school background where these weren't things that we talked about um, in my upbringing. So it's been, you know, it's developed over time, as I'm sure it has for many of us. Um, I may use statistics or sources that go against a value or basis faith systems beliefs. And it's good to keep in mind that in our roles, we are serving a vulnerable population and the values and faith system of those that we serve must come before our own. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but keeping those values in the forefront of what we're talking about versus our own. So it is their choice or the choice of their parents or guardians, not ours. There may be times I might say graphic words or describe some potentially disturbing content Thank you for understanding its importance. Um, just please remain respectful and courteous. Um, a month ago when we did this, everyone was amazing, very respectful. So I have no concerns, um, especially because you're here and I appreciate that you are here. Also just a note on language, words and language are powerful tools by which an individual can express ideas, whether abstract or concrete, and the meanings we attach to words influence the attitudes that we have towards the subjects of discussion. So in the autism community, community many self-advocates and their allies prefer terminology such as autistic or autistic individual 
because they and we understand autism as an inherent part of the individual's identity, similar similar to um, individuals in deaf culture. Deaf individuals prefer deaf to be first, similarly to autistic. Um, however, commonly we use person first language as the most accepted in reference to other disabilities, including IDD, and that's what we commonly use in this field. Um, so most of the time I kind of flip flop between both of those, just so you're aware though that I know that these are sensitive topics. Also in the presentation, I refer to the queer community as a whole, including all LGBTQIA2 plus persons as LGBTQ, just for brevity purposes as well. All right, so let's dig in here. What is sexual behavior? So sexual behavior encompasses all activities which reinforce or gratify is the term often used in reference to sexual behavior in individuals sexual wants and needs. This includes but is definitely not limited to masturbation, oral genital stimulation, aka oral sex, penile vaginal intercourse, aka vaginal sex, and anal stimulation or anal intercourse. Again, definitely doesn't cover all sexual behavior, but that's what's commonly most referred to. It may also include activities to attract the sexual interest of others, including flirting, touching, and personal bonding. Sometimes we also might look see grooming um, or other things that lead up to those sexual behaviors. Individuals engage in sexual behaviors for a variety of reasons differ in their acceptability based on societal norms. What is accepted here in the United States is different than it would be in Asian countries or in Dubai or different places around the world have different levels of acceptability surrounding that. And even different religions have different levels of acceptability. Um, and it changes over a lifespan. What's acceptable for teenagers is different than what's acceptable for adults is different than what's acceptable for those reaching their geriatric years. So first question, what sexual behaviors do you see most often in your setting that are concerning, um, that are areas to target, um, and things that you would like to hear more about? Um, if you want to go ahead and send in the chat, that would be awesome. I know, yeah, master, I was going to say last presentation, masturbation and touching were the big ones. And again, I'm getting lots of masturbation, co concepts of ascent, all of, yep, cor inappropriate courting behavior. Yeah, not reading those signs, touching, kissing, playful touching. Yes, definitely. All of the things. Um, the guardian, guardianship issues for sure. Yeah, so these are definitely some of the things that we're going to talk about um, and talk about them in a little bit more detail, for sure. Um, so as you can kind of see, even just in the chat, people are experiencing these issues, these problems, these inappropriate behaviors. Um, and really, it's important because despite common myths, individuals with IDD most commonly develop sexually across a lifespan on par with their chronological age. So although someone might be functioning the same as a five-year-old per se, intellectually, their body is still at their chronological age. So they might have brain function that resembles a lower age, but their body is still at that higher age and is developed as such and is feeling those feelings um, just as someone would of that same age. The expression of sexuality, including how individuals form and maintain intimate relationships is really a fundamental part of being human. Um, really you walk into pretty much most scillas, especially scillas that have individuals who are a bit younger. And the first thing people wanna tell you about is their girlfriend, their boyfriend, how they want to find a girlfriend, they want to find a boyfriend, the date they went on, 
how they want to get married, um, the person that they want to marry. All of these things are generally the first thing that people want to share because people know that these are that's part of being human. This is part of being an adult. These are things to strive to have, um, whether it's innate or whether it's because society has shaped it to be so, those are things that have become part of developing across a lifespan. Um, contemporary research also has shown the intersection of autism, sexuality, and gender identity, and has found that autistic individuals are more likely to identify as LGBTQ than the neurotypical population. Similarly, the prevalence of autism is higher among transgender people than it is cisgender individuals and disability and LGBTQ equals a twice vulnerable population. Lastly, and most importantly, if it's important to those that we support, it's important to us. So because it's important to them, we need to also make it important to us and find a way to make these things more achievable for them. Um, and more normalized. Okay, so going, looking at all of this, we kind of have to look at what has shaped how we respond over time. And heteronormativity plays a really huge role in that. So normativity is a social construct by which the dominant population asserts itself as normal and attempts to shape all others to fit their mold through systemic assimilation. Heteronormativity goes a step further than that and is a social construct in which it is seen as pure or right to value and behave as such. No solo sex, partnered sex only after marriage, no divorce, sex as a pri is primarily for procreation and not for pleasure. So when you think about the way that the United States has been formed and shaped over time. It started as a Christian nation, and essentially these are Christian values. Um, are they all Christian values? No, not every Christian has this mindset, but that kind of has been how that has occurred across generations um, who have taught the next generation. And I think just now, like Gen Z more so, um, has been starting to challenge some of these norms. So we're starting to get further away from that, but still when we look at individuals with IDD and the staff that is serving them directly, whether they're guardians or in a CILA, a lot of this mindset still is very prevalent. Yes, because heteronormativity values are often presented as the standard by parents, teachers, DSPs, etc. Um, I know when I was a teacher and I had paras and I would have, you know, a 12 year old boy talking about wanting to kiss so and so and they would say, oh, no, that's for when you're married, when you're grown up, you'll get married and then then you can kiss someone when you're grown up and get married. Um, it's kind of the fallback and the way to explain it to individuals who people think aren't understanding anything deeper than that. Um, and many times it comes from a place of wanting to protect or viewing those with disabilities as more similar to children. So even when they're not children and they are adults who are living in cellas, that infantilization takes place in which we're in an effort to protect them, babying them or treating them younger than they are. Um, also, children's books, shows, and media primarily portray heteronormativity. Um, this is improving in some ways. There are more children's shows that show same-sex couples and things like that. But often those children's materials are the materials that individuals with developmental disabilities gravitate towards, to gravitate towards even in adulthood. Um, so those are the things that they're still seeing as the norm, even when they're adults and other things could be the norm and other things could be acceptable, but that's not things that they're seeing within their general circles. So since sexual behavior is for after marriage and solo sexual behavior is weird or immoral per heteronormativity, why teach about sex, condoms, birth control, or STIs? Why teach about masturbation? 
why provide comprehensive sexuality education? Um, if that's something that people see as not okay, why teach it? We obviously know that that should not be the case. Um, and intervening in a way that is indicative of heteronormativity being better or right compared to a behavior that is anything other than illegal really goes against human rights and ethics codes of conduct. Um, I'm particularly referring to for behavior analysts, um, but I'm sure for other professionals as well, because at our core, we should be serving those that we support um, and keeping it their values in the forefront of our mind. And just from a behavior analytic lens, what happens when we deny access to reinforcement for something that is highly motivating and desired? When we deny access, we want it more, right? So if we tell someone that they can, their favorite thing that they want more than anything is Swedish fish and tell them, nope, you can't have Swedish fish. Those are not for you. They are going to continue to want Swedish fish more than anything else because they do not have access to that thing that they're that they're desiring. Um, so understanding deprivation really under really helps us understand all behavior, but especially sexual behavior as well. Oftentimes, that deprivation of sexual access and sexual release is setting individuals up to fail, because as adults, as sexual beings. That's something that the desire is there and the desire oftentimes does not go away until that need is met. So by depriving, we're seeing that come out in other quote unquote inappropriate ways, um, causing us to often get stuck in an ineffective, ineffective cycle of punishment for that inappropriate sexual behavior. Kind of going back to that Special Olympics example, like those individuals were punished. They were not able to participate in Special Olympics um, for maybe they had like a suspension for a certain amount of time. And really, what does that teach an adult individual who is desiring sex? You have sex. You don't get to do things you want to do. That doesn't stop anyone from continuing to want sex, right? It just band-aids or causes something in that moment. Yeah, exactly. That sex is bad, that sex is not normal, that that's not something you should have. Um, exactly. So we it's really time for us to move beyond that piece of it. Okay, so some other ethical considerations. Um, inappropriate sexual behavior, those words are really highly subjective um, because appropriate varies again, across settings, across cultures, across even individuals. What exactly is the inappropriate sexual behavior? If it's disrobing, if it's not sexual in nature, just call it disrobing. I know oftentimes at SST, we get referrals for inappropriate sexual behavior. And upon digging deeper, it's disrobing. It's not wearing clothes. It's um, concerns regarding toileting, toileting in different places, things like that. Um, and if it's not sexual, let's not call it inappropriate sexual behavior and let's just name it what the behavior is. Even when it is sexual in nature, naming it what is really happening can really help us be able to pinpoint and target that a little bit better. Really consider how skill deficits may be impacting the behavior. Does the person understand age? Do they have perspective taking skills? If they are not vocal verbal, are they able to consent um, in other ways? Are they able to express that? And then think about human rights and promoting dignity, consent, and safety. If you're promoting human rights or promoting dignity, allowing for consent and making sure consent is happening and promoting safety, you're likely on the right track to be able to treat this correctly. Um, it's when other things get stuck in the mix that causes individuals to act unethically. So most inappropriate sexual behavior is caused by a la lack of knowledge, experience, or appropriate and comprehensive sexuality education. There is a lot of research to support this piece of it. Um, at the end, the references page has a lot of really great articles um, and much of it leans to this, that 
we are kind of missing the boat on um, the education piece of it. Yes, Danielle. Uh, Abby had a question for you, okay. and that was, how do you best approach situations where the individual is more curious about, about non-heteronormative sexuality, but their family and culture completely reject these ideas, and how do you respect the individual and their family at the same time? Yeah, that's so hard, and that is something that I don't know that there's one right answer to, um, but I think inviting everyone into a conversation and inviting that individual and the family to come together and have a conversation about what their values are, what the family values are, where those values differ, um, and then how to move forward from there so that that individual still has their rights and their values being honored. Because guardianship definitely is an issue as far as these things go. Um, we can't just respect everything an individual says if they're not their own guardian, but we still can respect what their values are and act in a way that serves them. Um, but I would definitely encourage just a conversation surrounding it um, and trying to get everyone to understand a little bit more of what is important. Um, and then Maureen had asked, um, does human sexuality education include items like disrobing, um, considering appropriate clothing and appropriate space? Yes, I think that is that comprehensive piece. It's all of the things that teach us what is expected as regards to our body um, and personal space. Um, and I'll go into that. That's actually what we're going to talk about a little bit more here. Um, but yeah, it definitely is a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge for teenagers, as Jeffrey expressed here. It's also a challenge for individuals with IDD who have guardians. Um, who are not understanding that moving beyond that heteronormativity piece. Um, sometimes it also might be helpful to share research regarding um, suicide and transgender individuals or suicide and LGBTQ individuals to show that really honoring one's identity is suicide prevention. Um, and is any individual who loves that individual wanting to prevent suicide or depression or mental health issues over time should help them understand a bit more, but definitely a challenge and something, um, especially in the political climate that we live in now, to move past and help honor that individual identity piece. All right, so just a little bit more on why sexuality education is important. Um, individuals with IDD had lower levels of sexual knowledge and experience in all areas except for menstruation for females and basic body part identification, which is shocking that those are the only two areas that we seem to do a good job teaching, but also not shocking because when you look at what we're teaching, I mean, I just think of doing in-home ABA with children. What's targeted and enables an NVB map? Body part identification. What do we write social stories for, for girls as they're getting older? Menstruation. Beyond that, there's not a lot of teaching happening um, until issues are arising. A recent study also concluded that most individuals with IDD receive sexuality education only after having engaged in sexual behavior that is considered inappropriate, offensive, or potentially dangerous. And when we fail to address the social and sexual desires, it can increase the behaviors of concern, but it can also increase sexual behavior. It can increase sexual behavior, but also verbal and physical aggression as well are shown to increase when those sexual behaviors are not met. Yeah, having another professional at the table and agreeing um, that it just makes it all the more difficult when people are not um, seeing the big picture and honoring that individual's rights for sure. So education is also important due to risk of sexual abuse. Um, in 2020, the National Crime Victim Survey found that people with disabilities experience higher rates of sexual violence than people without disabilities, um, significantly so, 45 victimizations per 1,000 persons with people with disabilities compared to about 25 for those without disabilities. So almost 50% more. 
Um, and without comprehensive sexuality education, individuals with IDD are at an increased risk of sexual abuse for the reasons that they are unable to provide reports to parents, professionals, or law enforcement due to their communication deficits. They also may fail to report because they don't have the knowledge to know that it's wrong. Um, they also might not have the terminology of different body parts. They might not have the words of the actions that happen to them. Um, lots of issues related to deficits when it comes to abuse. Um, individuals with disabilities are also at risk of poor sexual health. Um, comprehensive sexual sexuality education is needed to promote proper health and birth control. Poor hygiene can result in physical pain um, as well as sickness, while proper hygiene can promote a sense of physical well-being and increase self-esteem. And just thinking about the individuals that you currently support, are there individuals you think are independent in their personal care, their ADLs? Um, however, did you get that information from parent report? Oh, yep, they know how to shower. They know how to clean themselves. Um, and is it possible that their personal care isn't covering those private areas? Um, we especially see increased UTIs um, in females and increased irritation in men. Um, due to that personal care not covering those areas, just because no one has taken the time to truly teach and teach in detail how to clean, how to clean safely, and why that that's important. Teaching sexuality education alongside correct anatomy increases the likelihood of reporting pain or discomfort, which could prevent a small health ailment from becoming acute. Um, I know I had an individual I worked with who had a UTI that wasn't addressed because she was complaining of pain, um, but wasn't able to express where, just kind of was pointing to her stomach. Um, and it ended up turning into a kidney, kidney infection before it was addressed because of that communication issue. So when we look at creating a sexuality education program, we want to first provide accurate information Second, develop personal values. And third, develop the necessary social competence, which is usually the trickiest and hardest part. When we're looking at providing accurate information, we wanna provide information that is accurate, timely, and understood while identifying the deficits. So what skills or knowledge do they already have? Um, consider using or really ideally even making your own a skills assessment. Um, there's some good ones out there. The tool for the assessment of levels of knowledge, sexuality, and consent. So the Talk SC or the Talk SCR. Those take a little bit of um, training, but the training is out there and available. The Ask is another um, assessment tool. Planned Parenthood has a disability toolkit that's linked at the end that has a great mini assessment. Um, the Nas National Sex Education Collaborative also has a good assessment in it that is free. Um, and go ahead and send now if there's any other assessments that you would recommend um, in the chat if you have them. Yeah, Sybil is, is sharing very similarly. Um, years ago, she was working. Someone said that they were independent with bathing, only need needed help washing their hair, which was really far from the case. Um, and that's oftentimes what we see. We're hearing, oh yeah, they know how to do it. They're independent with bathing. They get in the water, they get out and dry themselves, but are they really clean? Do they really take care of the places that they need to have clean? Usually not. Um, but yeah, feel free to keep sending any assessment tools that I didn't mention or missed. Um, Cause I know there's things out there that I also don't know about. And really, we just want to keep looking at what is socially valid at this point in the person's life. Life um, Comprehensive sexuality education is individualized and personalized. So if it is, there's issues with disrobing, it addresses those issues with disrobing. If there's issues with, you know, menstruation, wearing a pad, it's addressing that. If it, there's issues with wanting sex, it really should include STIs, what this looks like, consent, all of that um, to really be effective and meaningful. 
So then next, we really want to develop individual personal values. So supporting the development of individual personal values reflective of their belief system, religion, and culture. Um, again, not ours. Yeah, the Circles program, we'll talk about that in a minute too. I love the Circles program to teach about relationships um, and boundaries. Um, but developing values in areas such as personal responsibility, self-esteem, right versus wrong, reality versus fantasy. This is a huge one um, because lots of times our individuals come up with people they're going to date, they're going to marry, they're going to move here. And it might be a complete fantasy situation that they've developed. Um, and while that's okay for them to think about those things, having them know what is reality and what is fantasy really helps limit some of those inappropriate comments, touches, ideas to know you might think that and you might want to imagine about that, but that is a fantasy fantasy situation. Um, interpersonal respect, personal limits, um, that involves personal limits around their disability, boundaries, and sexual identity. And just while doing all of this, we want to be mindful of the impact of heteronormativity and infantilization on parental or individual shame. Yes, so per HCBS settings rule, um, the educational tools do need to be used. This does need to be included in services that are provided um, for us in the SILAs or create one that meets their standard exactly. And sometimes created, creating one that meets their standards can be more individualized than some of the packaged um, curriculum tools. So then that last piece of developing the social competence, um, we wanna support the development of necessary social repertoires, such as, as prerequisites to dating or interpersonal sexual relationships, including decision-making skills, self-advocacy, refusal skills, um, making sure individuals really have a strong and functional no with adults or staff, um, as well as their peers, because it's very helpful to remember that noncompliance can be a huge strength sometimes and when that, that is appropriate to use. But for the individuals who are super compliant and easygoing and easy to work with and a joy and all of those wonderful things are often the individuals that are also sexually abused. Um, we wanna teach them avoidance of dangerous situations. What are dangerous situations? What does that look like? What does that feel like? Discussing sexual desires and wishes, making sure it's not taboo. People have an outlet to get that communicated and feel like people are working towards that with them. Discussing STIs and birth control um, and then dating. Just think about all of the skills that are involved in dating, budgeting, planning, boundaries, communication, um, so many things incorporated in just dating that might come so easily or sort of easily um, to some of us. So when we look at some possible topics by age, um, looking at the pre-K through elementary age, so pre-puberty, teaching public versus private, good touch versus bad touch, safe versus unsafe, body parts, um, including the penis and the vulva and the words for the actual body parts, personal space and boundaries, gender and gender identification, and an introduction to puberty, menstruation, and sex, even at a young age, especially those for those with disabilities, because that mastery of those concepts does take longer than it does for individuals without IDD. So the sooner we're introducing, the sooner they're mastering. Um, and then looking post-puberty, middle, high school, and into adulthood, safe sex, STIs and birth control, how to say no, when to say no, masturbation, public restroom use, attraction and sexual feelings, sexual preference, laws regarding sexuality, and again, whatever else is important to that person. Um, yeah, it's just, it's good to be aware. Like Marcel is saying, um, 
where individuals have been dating for years and then want to live with each other versus marry for financial reasons, there are more layers to all of it for individuals with disabilities who are receiving services um, due to financial li limitations and SSI. Um, and I think just having that awareness and knowing is so much better for individuals than having no awareness and creating situations in their head of things where they're going to get married and they're going to move in with this boyfriend. And a lot of that possibly might not be able to happen due to needs and due to financial reasons. Um, but creating that awareness is, is important um, because it's their lives and they should be aware of what's possible in their own life. Yeah, civil ceremony, great solution. Um, so some sample resources for sexuality education. There are so many things out there. There really are. I Circles has been mes mentioned in the chat and Circles program is awesome. Um, it's awesome as it is. And it's even more awesome when you can in individualize it and kind of create what behaviors also fit into what circle. Um, but starting with that and having individuals become familiar with it is a really great starting point to being able to teach lots of different things. Um, this Taking Care of Myself book is fantastic for going over the details of body parts. It's very graphic with lots of graphics, but in a helpful way. Um, the uh, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network has a resource that's free online that, um, so these, these items, the free items are linked at the end. So like I have some of these things linked or books um, where to buy them are also linked at the end. Circles is more expensive. So the things like that are not linked, um, but definitely something to speak to your organization about if you're really interested in. Um, and then there's also on the top here, more things that you can self-create. Um, so, you know, this plan, actually this Planned Parenthood resource is also a really great one, but um, these are just resources that are self-created resources um, to be used for teaching tools for just individuals um, having visuals. I mean, I prefer real pictures versus cartoon drawing, drawings as much as possible. Um, but yeah, there's lots of things out there. Yes, Danielle. Uh, Maureen asked, and I don't know if you know this or if anyone else um, knows this, but does the Division of Developmental Disabilities still provide the webinars on these topics um, that were shared during the HCBS rules? I actually don't know. Okay. And I I'm don't not know sure if either. they're approved on the HCBS list either. I do not. I'm not aware of that. Okay. If anyone is aware of it and can provide the website, um, you can throw that in the chat box. That would be super helpful for people. Yeah. And sometimes it's good to think about this too, as um, you might start with the things that are available on the HCBS list and then individualize for individuals beyond that, right? So you might be able to provide an improved curriculum for everyone. And that's kind of the general, everyone gets this. And then some people need additional education and additional support beyond that. Okay, open future learning. I haven't heard of that. That's great to know, has great sexuality resources. Good to know. Okay, so just some general guidelines for teaching these things. We want to, again, think ahead and be proactive, giving ourselves enough time for mastery, be concrete, um, use the names of things, have a serious, calm, and supportive demeanor. So it's not, it doesn't come across as shameful. Break larger chunks of information into smaller chunks. Um, it can be overwhelming for individuals, but it can be also be overwhelming for their guardians. It could also be overwhelming for their staff. Um, so breaking it down can be very helpful. Be consistent and repetitive. And remember the same techniques we use to teach other behaviors and skills can be used for sexuality education as well. So that includes social stories, visuals, video modeling, picture schedules, task analyses, shaping, chaining, um, and occasionally even discrete trial can be used as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for providing the HCBS information and the conversation cards from CQL. 
Um, those, those are awesome. And they are very LGBTQ friendly. Yes. Um, yes, for sure. I mean, answering their questions is they're changing and they're growing and educating them on their feelings just as what we would want for ourselves. Um, so as we know that we can educate and we can provide lots of resources and just as happens with other common behaviors of concern, sexual behavior may still not be treated by education alone. Um, so looking at that, we think of, okay, is this a skill deficit or is it a performance deficit? If they don't have the skills, that's one thing, but if they have the skills and the knowledge and they're still doing something else, that's another. Um, another way to kind of BCBA it, is it rule governed or is it contingency shaped behavior? Um, and so now when we're looking at those things that are more of a performance deficit or a contingency shaped behavior, we need to dig a little bit deeper. Um, I'm just get reading really quick. Yeah, Caitlin, this is a great question. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more um, in another slide, a couple, a couple down the road, but it is really important to support and address situations where um, children or nonverbal peers are being targeted and keep them safe as well. Um, so looking at so when it is that performance deficit or that contingency shaped behavior, we wanna look at what, what is the function. And function might not be simple because sexual behaviors can serve all functions, right? They have a very strong automatic or sensory function. They can serve the function of escape. They, attention is a huge function with lots of sexual behavior, but it can also be access, actual access to different environments, access to different people, access to lots of different things. Um, so consider moving beyond like a QB, QBAF and into in-depth interviewing um, in addition to those direct assessments. Um, we want to utilize a trauma or abuse assumed approach. So not just informed, but assumed because 44 to 83% of persons with IDD have been abused in their lifetime which is a heartbreaking statistic. But when we're looking at 50% of those that we serve experiencing abuse, we really need to be assuming that they have been abused. Um, and rates of other forms of trauma are likely even higher, given that these are individuals that have lived in maybe multiple different settings with individuals that aren't their family, or they don't have relationships, especially individuals who have come from SODCs or transitioning out of that setting. Um, just being very aware that this is, this is very important and this is something that they have experienced likely. Um, we want to include the individuals you support in the process as much as possible, respect their autonomy, identity, um, and consent or assent, and advocate for others to do the same. Honoring gender and sexual identities, it really is proven to be suicide prevention for transgender individuals, so that is very important to do so. If they want outcomes within their legal rights, advocate and work with your dream team to make that into a reality. Some individuals wants, want to date online or in person. How can that come become a reality? Um, sexual opportunities, how can that become a reality? Access to legal pornography or masturbation tools, and then access to local pride community events should also be something um, that they are able to achieve as well. Yeah, yeah, access to kink groups for sure. Um, so looking at, um, Sharon, maybe let's come back to this at the at the end um, because I want to address your question um, a little bit more fully. So we wanted to consider the motivating operations. Um, so motivating operations for the, the non-BCBA folk um, is things that make 
anything more or less valuable to us. So if we are thirsty, it is a motivating operation to want water. Um, if we have just drank a gallon of water, that's a motivating operation to not want water, an abolishing operation. Um, so individualized treatment requires you to effectively identify and utilize those motivating operations, those MOs, again, just like any other behavior of concern. So some sexual behavior specific MOs to consider are sexual desire, loneliness, or the need for connection outside of just sexual. That's a huge one for a lot of the individuals we serve. Jealousy, if they're seeing others have access to things um, and opportunities because of a sexual relationship, that could be a motivating operation. Avoidance of uncomfortable feelings, safety of the client, which could be an MO for the organization, safety of the staff, again, an MO for the organization, and then safety of the community members. So an MO for the organization and then also the community as a whole. So when those motivating operations, those MOs are reinforced, their desire lessens, and we need to think about how this can work in relation to the sexual behaviors of concern. Um, MOs, motivating operations, those are MOs. So those are um, the things that make in this, for the sake of this presentation, sexual behaviors more or less likely to occur based on their value. So decreasing that value of sex by having access to sex, decreasing that value for an orgasm by having access to an orgasm through self-stimulation or things like that. Um, so when we look at consent or assent, um, in the context of sexual behavior, consent is an agreement between participants to engage in a specific act at a specific time. It is ongoing, it's not just one and done, and it has three key pillars, knowing, so consent must be coherent and understood. It also must be voluntary, requires informed, mutual, mutual, honest, and verbal or nonverbal agreement and communicated. So consent is not assumed and can be withdrawn at any time. Assent is perceived consent by someone legally unable to provide consent on their own. So when we look at individuals who are non-vocal verbal, this is something that's very important. This typically is determined through perceived willingness to participate by statements, body language, um, going towards or coming away from such as those things. Um, to program, to teach consent and assent, we want to model what you want those you support to display. This includes respecting body autonomy as much as possible, gender expression, and creating a culture of mutual respect. Explicitly teach what consent is and get it anytime you are assisting in personal care tasks. Um, so a lot of the individuals that we support, they need lots of help with their personal care. They need someone to be touching them in private areas. Consent should be obtained, even though these are things that are happening on a daily basis. Hey, I need to wipe you. Is it okay if I reach my hand back and wipe you? You're behind and waiting for that yes, or even that sign language yes, or any type of consent that that's okay for that to happen. Um, and the more it's practiced and the more it's taught, the easier it will be for individuals to grant. Um, visuals can help with this as long as, as well as just slowing down that pace. Uh, I think sometimes we all get so wrapped up in all the things that need to get done in a day that it's hard to slow down and take the time to obtain consent, but it's important we do so because it's modeling that behavior that we want them to show as well. Um, also, this is another thing that ties into the HCBS rule, but practice knocking and obtaining consent before entering rooms or private spaces. Um, that should happen every time you're knocking. Is it okay if I come in? And sometimes there might be an emergency, but oftentimes, you have that minute to wait and obtain consent before entering. Modeling boundaries, um, say what you mean and mean what you say. No means no isn't just for sex, right? So if someone tells you no, you ask a question, can you get a cup? And they say no, 
you ask the question. They said, no, honor the no. Um, just teaching that words have meaning and we respect words. Um, Cause that is, that modeled over time creates awareness of it. And then it creates that habit to develop for them as well. Okay, so when we look at targeting non-consensual touching, staff may be the targets of sexual behavior, including touching, kissing, or other uncomfortable or potentially offensive acts. Um, I'm sure most of you on the webinar, as well as myself, have experienced this to some extent. Um, it goes back to knowing your people and knowing the function. So if it's automatic, or sensory in nature or boundary confusion. So if this individual doesn't understand, doesn't know, et cetera, it's a teaching opportunity. Give them the replacement behavior or the rule, collect the data and move on. That's what it is. It's a teaching opportunity. It might feel uncomfortable and I'm not validating, I'm not trying to say that, that your feelings or your body also doesn't matter because it absolutely does. But for that individual, it's a time to teach. If the function is to escape or avoid, give them the replacement words and let their words be powerful. They're, they touch, are touching you inappropriately to get out of the situation that they're in. Having them ask, hey, I want to be all done. I don't want to do this, et cetera. And then honoring that is much more effective than engaging in an inappropriate touch to get out of something. Um. April, I 1000% agree with you with the issue with non-compliance is attract behavior. Um, they are allowed to say no and refuse and it can be super important for them to do so. Um, and when we think, when we are teaching or come with the idea that they can't say no, it creates lots of other issues down the line. Um, Yeah, absolutely. If if someone isn't consenting, it is an issue, right? That is a time that no should be respected because consent was not achieved. Um, so looking back at the at the functions, we covered automatic, we covered escape. If it's for attention, which oftentimes it can be for attention, sometimes that turn on or their reinforcement really comes from knowing that they are getting under your skin. If that's the case, we want to deny the behavior its function, right? They want to watch you squirm. Don't let them watch you squirm. Stay calm. Stay neutral. Don't attend. Maybe they're not just looking to watch you squirm. Maybe they're looking for a verbal reprimand. Don't give the verbal reprimand. Move on and engage in something else. Um, but when we look at treating things function-based, we really need to know what that function is to be able to do so effectively. Okay, so with age confusion or pedophilic behavior, pedophilia is most commonly, not always, but most commonly not diagnosed until someone has committed a crime. Um, with individuals with IDD, might not be considered a crime in the sense of a crime, but until there's an issue. However, if the individual can't advocate or explain the situation or their thought process, how do we know the true intent? Oftentimes, we don't. Individuals with IDD may make mistakes related to age confusion. Um, again, when I was way back, 16-year-old working in the field, um, there were many times I was touched inappropriately as a minor or told sexual comments as a minor. Um, and really, I didn't even think about it at the time. But looking back, that's something that someone probably should have been addressing, right? Because my age wasn't the age where those kind of comments are okay. And that's something to be aware of when we're teaching our individuals. If they're going to be going out in the community, um, especially going out in the community without staff support, they need to be aware of issues regarding age um, and knowing the ages of people before making certain comments. Um, and then sometimes it isn't just age confusion. Sometimes it really is pedophilic behavior, in which case we want to control the environment as much as possible, caution staff to be mindful of their cell phone pictures or background. Um, so there's not pictures of, you know, minors easily accessible or around. 
ensure proper internet restrictions are in place and adhered to. Um, these are the times to get those restrictions approved if it's going to really prevent something awful from happening. Close supervision in public spaces, especially around children. Yes, definitely share what staff wears. Be very cautious. Um, staff and volunteers in the community should be aware and trained in their behavior support plans. They shouldn't be able to attend something without training have taken place prior um, and consider one-on-one -on -one staffing for that individual if um, it's appropriate. Um, really, and seek out experts if you are unsure. Ask those questions. Um, it's really better to be safe than sorry. And while we don't want to take away individuals' rights, we also want children um, and minors in our community to be safe. Um, I think, yeah, what staff wear is something that is, a, is important with pedophilia, but also many different kinks and interests. Um, I mean, currently I have a client that I'm working with that um, is, I did not know that he had a foot fetish. Um, and he was asking me so nicely, like, take off your shoes, take off your socks, put your foot here. And I was like, oh, he just wants me to be comfortable. That's so nice. Um, lo and behold, me taking away my foot at the end of the session resulted in SIB and aggression. So it was obviously more than just him wanting me to be comfortable. Um, so obviously in that situation, I'm not going to go into that home and take off my shoes and my socks again, because I know that that will cause an issue, not only behaviorally, but also due to that sexual desire piece of it. Okay, so the most commonly asked about, talked about, or wanted to be talked about thing, masturbation. So masturbation is self-stimulation of the genitals for pleasure and self-comfort. Um, fetal masturbation has been described starting at 15 weeks gestation and can, can continue through infancy and childhood. So with that said, it's normal. Masturbation is a normal biological process. It's something that happens. It's not something that needs to be hidden away. Um, masturbation is safer than any other type of sex. There's no risk of pregnancy. There is no risk of STIs. Reaching an orgasm through masturbation may decrease the MO, the motivating operation for sex or other sexual behaviors as it releases mood boosting endorphins. So common concerns related to masturbation in the IDD population include occurring in public, occurring compulsively or at high rates, and then occurring without reaching orgasm. So we'll kind of talk through each of those a little bit. Public masturbation. So these are the times to really teach those boundaries of private versus public. A reasonable expectation is to teach masturbation is acceptable in the bedroom or bathroom only, ideally the bedroom, um, but sometimes in a scylla that can be challenging. Alone time in the bedroom, yeah, can be tricky in a scyllas with shared bedrooms or smaller homes. Teaching self-advocacy and respecting self-advocacy can help, um, you know, just like those com those college dorm room situations where people would put a, you know, a hair tie on the door. Having individuals be able to have different processes like that in their home so that they know when someone needs private time is something that the whole house can benefit from. Um, for those that are unable to distinguish between public and private, I have found it helpful just in my experience over time to make another stimulus, the SD or the signal for masturbation or private time. Um, so something such as a blanket, it only happens when this blanket's present. A pillow, um, like a special body pillow or something that they are start to associate with that being allowed. Um, a color changing light bulb, picking a color. I had a client that when the purple light was on, it was okay for them to have private time. That meant that could occur when the light wasn't purple. That wasn't the time for that. Um, and then allowing it to occur in the presence of that stimulus and not any other time can be helpful when traveling or moving frequently um, if that private public thing is too much of an abstract concept for the individual to understand, which oftentimes it can be. And then it feels very tricky. Yeah, just some sample resources here. Um, these two books are linked at the back because I or at the end of the slideshow because I really like both of them for teaching public and private. Um, you know, creating a list with individuals. It's okay when it's not okay when 
you know, having clear visuals in your bedroom, door closed, alone, only you, curtains closed, cameras and devices off, important things to have in place. Um, you know, maybe it's a body pillow, maybe a masturbation occurs in the presence of these, or maybe it's, you know, a light that that is going to be the cue. Another issue is compulsive masturbation. Um, so most commonly compulsive meaning it happens at a rate that interferes with ability to complete daily activities occurs for one of two reasons, either limited leisure skills or the individual is not reaching climax or orgasm. Um, so for the leisure skills piece of it, looking for sensory activities and activities involving physical touch can be good replacements. If these are not available, food and drink can help because masturbation and touching, that releases those endorphins and the dopamine. Food and drink can have that same kind of release and the brain. So it can be a good replacement when it has to be. Um, if masturbation is occurring and you're needing to redirect it, think of transitioning from masturbation to a preferred sensory tool or activity or a food or drink. So something kind of just a step lower on the reinforcing scale than to other preferred activities, another step lower than to non-preferred activities or work or things that they aren't wanting to do. We're not looking to go from masturbation to work. Um, that's like a recipe for problem behaviors to occur. Also trying to think of activities that are incompatible with masturbating. So if they're using their hands, getting them involved in something that's also using their hands. If they're using their legs, involved in something, going for a walk, something that's using their legs. Um, and then keep expanding their leisure repertoire. Adults can learn and enjoy new things too. Um, just because an individual is an adult doesn't mean that they aren't capable of enjoying and getting to like new things. So some sample resources, um, some sensory tools, um, even for adults, adults can like things like rice bins too. It feels good. It has a sensory function. A marble run um, keeps people's hands busy. And a lot of times for individuals who really like a lot of sensory stimulation, it can be a leisure skill that, you know, serves some type of function. Same thing with a lot of these things on the bottom, just sensory tools that can be reinforcing. Um, maybe it's a video game system. Maybe they want a video game system and that's going to be something that's going to increase a leisure activity that's going to take some time away from the compulsively masturbating. Um, the other issue with masturbating is sometimes it happens without orgasming. Some individuals have learned that touching feels good, but are not able to climax, causing frustration or other behaviors of concern. Um, this is especially common in young males who get erections but do not ejaculate. Um, which can be very painful and confusing to them and cause a lot of problem behaviors to occur. However, it's not limited to males as females must can also be frustrated, knowingly or not, by a lack of climax. Often when this occurs, we see long sessions of masturbating. So they're masturbating for hours. They have an erection for a long period of time, uh, masturbating using a variety of topographies. Maybe they're touching themselves. Maybe they're humping a pillow. Maybe they're humping a chair all of these different things trying to get to a climax that they're not achieving um, or even attempting masturbation with other individuals. So grabbing someone, bringing them over to them to try to help get, the, get to that release. Um, if this is occurring, really spend some time observing the individual who's struggling as uncomfortable as it might be to see what they're gravitating towards um, when they're sexually aroused, what they're doing while they're trying to masturbate to see what it is that like what kind of sensation are they seeking and then try to duplicate those sensations um, as much as possible while shaping a more appropriate or more useful form um, I think of I had a individual years ago that really wanted was seeking like a leg like like the leg to masturbate and we created a pillow that had a baseball bat on the inside that kind of had that same sensation as a leg where there's a hard covered by soft and really shaped that into the tool instead of using an individual's leg. Um, another kind of um, one that comes to mind is that an individual who was using 
like the arm of a chair and we moved that chair into his room and just made it yep that's where you get to do it so while instead of trying to fight the battle of that's not where you do it that's not here moving it into that appropriate place and having that be okay um, in that setting and then trying to transfer it to a different chair so the family could have their lazy boy back in their living room um so lots of times it's just those little baby steps at a time to try to create it more appropriate, more useful, getting there, like baby steps. Um, sample resources here. Um, there's a lot of tools that we really don't utilize enough with individuals with IDD. Um, you think about the sex toys that individuals without disabilities have access to, Playboy magazines and porn, et cetera. Those, these things are out there and they can be very helpful to an individual who's really struggling to reach that climax, that orgasm. Um, I put the picture of Baby Bob to remind me of a client that I um, had that was that would watch Barney and get to the point where Baby Bob was showing her breasts and pause there and that was getting him to climax and everyone was trying to interrupt it because Barney wasn't age appropriate etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like wait he's actually using this as a tool to to masturbate and to orgasm so let's let him go ahead and do that that's his way to reach that um you know a swing like this might be really helpful for some individuals a vibrating pillow um, can be more socially acceptable um, than some of the sex toys. So that might be kind of a step to shape guardian behavior and guardian acceptability of the intervention. Um, great resources, Jaime, thank you. Uh, let's see. And just going back to the beginning, it really is expected and normal to be uncomfortable discussing sexual behavior with those that you serve. When you think about your own upbringing and your own learning history, your experience has shaped your values and your acceptability. And just like anyone else, we constantly are learning and progressing um, and getting to new levels of awareness. Sexual behavior has powerful automatic reinforcement, but is also very highly reinforced socially. So those two together, makes it something that is very reinforcing for very many of the individuals we serve. Um, working closely with those you support, your staff and the parents and guardians, bring them along in the learning journey with you. Um, instead of just explaining the intervention, explain the why. Explain why it's important. Explain the life changes that it might make. Explain what socially valid is. All of those things, having that open communication can really help bring people along and get them on board. Um, have them problem solve with you. Oh, this has been a problem for how long? What have you seen that's worked? All of those types of things. The more it can be a team approach, the better. Um, and remember to keep human rights, dignity, consent, and safety as the most important decision-making factors, and you are going to be pretty good to go. All right, questions, feedback. Um, I did link references as well as links here to some of the things that um, we saw and talked about. So when you get a copy of the presentation, these are attached as well. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and read through if there's any particular questions here. Yeah, I'm sorry that happened, Caitlin. That's a really disheartening story. Um, and we do need to address these things and address them effectively. Thank you all so much. Have a good one, guys. I appreciate you coming and being interested. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, a very important topic that doesn't of, often get discussed much. So we are super excited um, to have you here again to, to discuss this. Um, and everyone has been providing great feedback. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, um, 
certificates will be provided to you. Um, they will come to the email address that you registered with. Um, so be on the lookout for those by tomorrow afternoon, um, by end of business day tomorrow. Uh, like I said, we switched over to a new system, so you will automatically get those. Um, if for some reason you have an issue, feel free to um, email me. I had put my email address into the chat box. I can again, because there's a lot going on, but it is ddaily at hope.us. All right. I don't see any questions. So thank you, Caitlin. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining and have a great rest of your day. Hey guys.